more people coming in and out and entering into this study. Uh, we are very honored to have Mr. Solari come and join us and make himself available to uh, opportunity for more informal discussion than we had last night. And hopefully it will be more on a one-to-one -one basis as time and individuals will permit us. And I think without further introduction, I would uh, perhaps just turn the floor over to you, Paul. some questions. Uh, the, should he should he come to the microphone? Well that's yeah, yeah I'd rather not interfere with trying to talk to him try and set up the uh, in your book on minimization you show the development where you start laying the bedwork for mm -hmm. the city and build the city and then uh, at, I'm going to reach a certain point, dismantle it, and uh, then you can start all over again. What kind of uh, year, yearly phase, or I mean, how many years would this phase involve, give or take, a rough idea? Well, it would have to be a very rough because of uh, the, all the uh, unknowns that you are dealing with. Being just a, uh, you know, a, a uh, suggestion of a process, I couldn't give you numbers. If it was a very large structure, evidently it would take a number of t years to, to get to the point where you start the, the work. And uh, foundations, excavations and foundation would be a pretty sizable undertaking, maybe taking years and setting up industries that would be the in building industry of the city might take quite a number of years. Because I think it would be worth to set up a industrial plants that would pro be producing the city itself, you know, especially if it's a, <coughs> a prefabricated kind of system approach. But it would be, it would not so much be that how long it takes to get it started, which means get it working, but how long it might be able to withstand the obsolescence uh, cycle. So if it's something that works very well, it might go on for a number of generations. If it's something that doesn't work very well, one generation might be uh, the length of the, of the life of it. And that's why it would be important to have a, a system that it can be, get, that accepts uh, the, this kind of recycling. You assemble it and you disassemble it. Yes. Is the sole purpose for your miniaturization and conservation measures? Well, in, uh, if you take it as a, as a broad uh, look up upon things, I think that's, that's substantial enough to warrant something like that. But uh, that would be the, somehow the, the instrumental aspect of it. In other words, we, uh, as, as a physiological organism, have to do that in order to, to be and to survive. But the, the aim is not to, to save in energy, the aim is to, to have a life, uh, a fulfilling life. But this can be done only if we are able to, to do this, to be very frugal with the, the use of energy and use of matter. So in order to achieve a certain goal, we need a certain number of, of uh, instruments. And uh, the achievement of the goal is predicated on the, on the existence of those instruments. So that you can say that in order to achieve uh, a promising and a, a life that has a future, and it's a, it's a very intense life, you had to come up with systems which are very frugal in the use of energy. You say conservation of matter, but yet sociologists and a few communications experts especially feel that the system of tomorrow would be a low, high, uh, low energy uh, communities relying on communications yeah. transportation. moving ideas instead of moving hardware or right. software. I think that's only half of the, of the learning process and maybe not, not the most fundamental half. If we, if, if we admit that life is basically a learning process, 
then I think the environmental uh, learning it's uh, as fundamental as any and it's still going to be with us for a long time which means that we cannot rely only on uh, learning which is uh, coming from the, the electronic communication media. It has to come from those for a certain kind of, of information and then it has to come from the environment for another kind of information. And there are, the environmental information is absolutely fundamental for the simple reason that we are sensorial animals, we are environmental animals. And if we live in the illusion that we can get rid of the environment because now we have the, the, the remote uh, uh, information system, the, the system that can feed wherever you are all the information that you're asking for, I think we are not very, we are, we are not really setting ourselves in, a, in, a bet, in the best position to be whole humans. We might become naked minds of a, of a sort which means very skillful, very bright, but possibly not very compassionate or not very human in a full sense. Because we had to, we had to learn not just with our brain, but from our, with our brain through our bodies. So going one step further now, what type of social environment do you see being formed by your structures? But that's, uh, that's the step that I, I'm reluctant to, to suggest because it's not up to me to, to suggest it in a way. But it, the basis will be that you define environments which are, they have so much wealth in, in options and quality that a person there would find a, a good environment, a good milieu for the development of its own uh, knowledge process. And this knowledge, as I was saying, would involve the fact that you are, a, you are a physiologically and psychologically and somatically involved with it, with the environment, environment including people naturally. If, if we take an extreme case and we, we think on a, of a child boxed into a, a magic box where everything is, is brought in by a remote kind of information directly to the brain instead of being uh, sensed through the senses, including the skin and so on, this, this uh, child might develop, in, as I said, in a, in a very bright thinking machine. But one of the problems we are faced now is the fact that we, we tend to become thinking machines or, or else a storage of information, but not, not very uh, roundly uh, organized as human beings. And this is what the environmental condition should help to, to produce. Yes? How do you relate this to your process of spiritualization to, let's say, mass people? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I am a, I am a um, reader of Teilhard de Chardin, and he talks about the convergency of the phenomenon of life, and he, he has this convergency toward the, the God, the Omega point, which is somehow where God is, and I cannot follow him that far, but uh, yeah, I will agree with him that uh, in order to have a, a greater personality developed in every one of us, we must also develop a greater sociality and a greater uh, cooperative cooperation among ourselves. In other words, there is a convergency of a, of a good society with the, with the good persons that, that is going to compose the society. There is no divergency. And the fact that we are, for instance, on one limited planet shows very well that uh, unless there is cooperation, there is disaster, total disaster. But one could see it also in, uh, in, in terms which are maybe more repellent now, but they might be really what is going to happen, which means that mankind is going to somehow uh, come to the point where it, it becomes one creature more than what it is now, though it is already, in a way, one creature. The, the whole earth is one, one uh, in a way, one sensitized skin that tries to say something. If this comes about, then evidently the, this cooperative aspect is going to be at the center of the, of the question. And it might just be, be this cooperative aspect that is going to make us more personalized, more. Uh, more uh, uh, original in, in ourselves and we'll be able to be more original because the, the contest in, in which we are working is going to be so, so alive and so substantial. How do you relate to 
two units on it. When you, let's say that you have two cities that are involved, and how do you begin to get them to function in the same uh, wait, wait. manner as what you have proposed here for a single unit? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe they will not have to function in the same social manner. I don't know if there is an optimum, an optimum you know, of a political and social uh, setting. It might well be that uh, we might have a plurality of, um, of social systems. But we have them now, evidently. It might well be that there might be a good thing to have them uh, to, to, be, uh, to be here instead of having one system that is, that is used by all of mankind. But physically, it, it would be very much the linkage that we have now between cities, uh, different kinds of means of transportation systems. And uh, the, the, one of the problems is to be, to be able to eliminate this uh, daily cycle of moving people out in mass and then moving people in in mass, which is the, the commuting problem, which blows up so much of the, it makes for a, for a a gigantic uh, road, road system and uh, all the consequences that we are dealing with, the, the breakdown of the city because of just the existence of the road system and uh, the cost of running this kind of a pattern and so on. So if the community c comes about, but let's say by walking most, for most of the, for the mass of the population, then the commuting disappears as a problem, might become even a, an, an one of the nicest things about the city because walking in a good environment among other people and uh, with a great variety of conditions might be one of the best learning moments in the life of a, in this, the daily cycle of the life of a person. Are you suggesting that the, the very uh, broad scale of, of communication is one that is going to be worldwide and as a result why the, you'll have the, the uh, one environment which is local and the other one which is worldwide and not so much as a Intermediate steps. Is this what you're suggesting? You're eliminating basically the intermediate. Intermediate in, in the sense of, um, let's say, the suburban uh, texture or. Uh, yes. Well, communication <coughs> between two whole cities, Ames and Des Moines, like Scottsdale and Phoenix. Yeah. Well, there is the communication which is uh, which doesn't need uh, transportation; just needs transportation of, of information. That's yeah, we are very skilled at that, and we are going to become even more skilled. So that. In a way, that's not the problem. The problem is the, the, the truth and the, the honesty of the, of the message, not the, how we are going to carry the message. What we are not very skilled at is to transport uh, mass, tra transport matter, including ourselves. So if we can cut down the, in the size of this transportation problem, which is the logistical problem of the city, then we are much better off. And this goes for people and for all sorts of hardware and all sorts of, uh, of energy input and, and um, waste uh, retrieval. But I think we, we should have all sorts of sizes of communities, again, because uh, variety is very important. Yes. Okay. Uh, would you perhaps comment <coughs> Can you rephrase the question? <laughs> yes. Um, reading through your book, I see that the way you express your ideas, yeah. both graphically and uh, in written form, are rather different than uh, the usual architectural uh, communication. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah. Well, the, the concept that I'm trying to carry in the book and I'm trying to carry now more than in the book because the book was the beginning of this development of an idea. Uh, let's say the message, it's, it's not uh, a common message in the sense that it's not what you can find usually in an architectural uh, treaty. I'm not, in other words, I'm trying to ignore, for instance, the, the formal and the aesthetic aspects. Not because I don't think they're important, but I think those are the second next step. So I was trying mainly to, uh, from, from my point of view, to frame uh, this concept the best way I could. And I don't know if I succeeded. I know that it's difficult to read the book. And uh, it, the, some of the graphics are, um, are frightful, fright, frightening to people. But um, I think that's 
that's something they have to, you have to somehow accept. Uh, the idea it's, in a way, it's radical. It's radical in the sense that it tries to go back to the roots of things. And uh, being radical involves uh, elements of, um, of novelty. It shouldn't be necessarily so, but that's what it is. And uh, we are always uh, pretty uh, uh, skeptical or uh, frightened by novelty, especially when it involves, uh, you know, the whole, the total environment. So we we tend to accept all sorts of coercion that exist, and we we don't even think they are coercion. We f we feel very free by living uh, under those coercions, but they exist, and we accept them. We are very. Uh, Afraid of uh, of uh, being told that maybe there are there are uh, other kinds of uh, coercion that we have to accept just by the fact that we are uh, we live and uh, we have to uh, somehow survive and uh, survive in uh, in good condition. So when when I when somebody looks at one of those designs and that says, well, I don't like to live in a beehive, I think there are two mistakes there. One is that I'm not suggesting a beehive. Second is that if there is anything similar to the beehive in what I'm suggesting, we have to see what the advantage would be of, of, of using this scheme in comparison with, with the disadvantage that you have in living in, in a non-beehive scheme, or, or else in a beehive which is horizontal instead of having a beehive which is vertical. We live now in horizontal beehives, and uh, they don't really perform. I think the reason is because uh, they are too tenuous. They are not able to support logistically, physically, the, the laws that we are, uh, we are uh, asking from them. And this is because of the information load and the transportation load, mainly. Yes? Well, the workshop is a mixture of um, uh, trying to uh, somehow, within the condition that we find ourselves, try to carry on an idea and develop it into into a reality. That's that's the main the main goal. The only is to be able to to uh, reach a number of young people and uh, see how far you can go in in uh, illustrating them a certain concept and try to develop, begin the uh, development in their own minds of, of the possibility of this concept, or how far you can get with it, and why it should be attempted, and so on. And depending on uh, what kind of background you have and what kind of interest you have, you might find yourself very involved in it or somehow disturbed because you don't really know where, where you stand, which happens. But the, the, the accent is in, in a building, which means uh, physical work, seven and a half hours a day, for five days a week. But while you're working, you're naturally, you're talking, you're communicating, and you are, uh, you're getting ideas from what you're doing. So there's a pretty active mental thing going on. You're not working to develop a technique so that what you build today, you, you disassemble tomorrow, which is very often what, what happens. You build a, <clears throat> you know, a wall or a, uh, you cast in a certain way, then uh, w when, once you find out what, what you were after, it, you, you demolish this exper experiment and you start all over again. What we are doing there is, in a way, it's the opposite. It's not so much how we do this wall or the, how we use this technique that it's important, I think, but it's, what are you trying to achieve by this activity, this physical activity, which is to define an environment that uh, it's not, is not available in, in other places and see how this environment can, you can interact in this environment. So you're building, you're working now for something that is going to come tomorrow, let's say, or a few years from now. So you have to have some kind of a faith in what you're doing. If you have that, then you might find the satisfaction of, of being a, a maker of this thing and possibly learning from the experience. Do you think I could get a glass of water? Thank you.
Yes. From two of your answers uh, this morning, one about the interaction of man inside your city, one about the interaction between these various cities. Mm -hmm. uh, I gather you view this as an example of function following form. Uh, go ahead. I, is that the end of the question? No. no. Go ahead. Uh, if so, or if not, how did you determine the form of Arco City? Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, always a little difficult to to say a posteriori how you got to it, and uh, if you have some experience about designing, you you realize that. Uh, what we always say is that I'm not going to think in terms of, of forms. I'm going to think in terms of function, and then I'm going to be very honest. I'm going to follow through, and I'm going to come up with the right answer. So I establish the function. I, I start with those, uh, you know, nice, neat um, uh, diagrams where I have different functions. I connect them in different ways, and I keep working around the uh, transportation systems, the connection systems, the functional, the, the aspects of every element, and so on. And I keep going that way until, uh, by some kind of miracle, the, this abstract thing becomes a concrete thing, becomes a a plan instead of being a um, a diagram. Um, well, I did that for a long time when I was in school and after school. And I still think it's a good idea, but it goes only so far because it comes the moment when you have to really to have to deal with the, with this diagram, this symbol, and you have to transform, transfigure this symbol in a, in an object, sometimes a very large object. And at that point, probably there is something in your background. That is going to uh, to make the decisions, and those decisions are not rational. Are just the fact that you are made in a certain way, and you are presented with a, with this set of, of informations, and you are going to come up with a with a design with a building. Um, at that point, I think it's where some some of the aspects of, of function following form uh, come in, and the more you have. Uh, Let's say ability or capacity for for uh, vi visualizing spaces, the more that might become important. So there is a there is a moment of contrast, there a moment of of uh, uh, maybe balancing between the purely rationalization of your diagrams and what instinctually or whatever you want to call it genetically or whatever it is, you are going to come up uh, to to invest this diagram with your own. Uh, your personal uh, style or formalization or so on. As far as the, the Arcosanti design, one of, one of the originating uh, elements was that I'm very keen about working outdoor. I like to do it myself and I like to see people in a position of doing it if they want to. So this idea of, of sheltering large spaces was, was some of the, the originating uh, structure or pattern. And then I started with the, and I, I tend to, to uh, use very simple schemes, at least at the beginning. So I, I choose the square. So what I did, I put four of those sheltered places on the four corners. So I, I would have four climates. And then I started thinking in terms of how people would, would be able to work out uh, in this scheme. So the modular uh, aspect came in the scale. And uh, pretty soon I found out that those apses would have to have a, a minimum size in order to function. And that minimum size defined, uh, the, in a way, the size of the building. Now, I knew that I wanted to work out something for a small number of people between uh, a thousand and maybe three or four thousand. So this element of, of uh, the module, the minimum module in the, in the apps, and the fact that this building would not have 20,000 people and so on, began to define the size of the, the building. You purposely treat all locations the same, though, irregardless of, of the orientation? Of you mean the size? Yes. Well, that, that, that uh, when I was at that point, I was still, I knew where, where the, where, what the climate was. I didn't know exactly what the land was. The, the site wasn't chosen because we didn't have the land. 
but uh, I knew that I wanted to f define something that would uh, allow for those sheltered spaces. And then uh, I somehow doubled that, uh, that square into a rectangular uh, scheme because uh, I find out that I needed more space. I find out that by doing this, I, w I would add somehow one, um, one variation because on one side, you have a certain dimension on the side, you have a double dimension, so you develop other things. But I'm sure I f I'm forgetting lots of the reasons why I got into it. Um, and, uh, but it, with me, I think it's always very, very important to keep in mind this fact that uh, there are things that you do and uh, you, don't, you don't know exactly why you do them. And that doesn't have to be uh, just a, uh, you know, a, um, an extravagance if you have a background that somehow supports you in, in what you are doing, you're coming up, that you cannot absolutely rationalize. Because we can always find justification for what we do. And I think there is a little hypocrisy in deciding that those justifications are really justifying everything and that those are rational justifications. Uh, the point is to be able to go beyond the rational into the super rational and not go uh, uh, under it and become irrational. But that's a, that's a risk. Yes? Could you elaborate on maybe some of the actual problems that you've come across in, in the building of this building here? Putting it down. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the main problem is uh, money. In order of importance, uh, the means, which means cash one way or the other, uh, second, people, uh, third, know-how. Uh, supposing that, the, again, the why and the what are, are clear. So I think that I know why I, I want to do this. I know what, what is going to be more or less uh, the problem is to be able to, to find the means of implementing it. And the next problem is to, to find the people that are willing to, to get involved with it. And if you have lots of money, you don't need that. You can just say, I, I get a, a contractor and uh, we go on, which I don't think is the way I'd like to see it anyhow. I would like to see the people involved in the construction being the people that are going to be involved in using it. So even if we had lots of money, I think I still would like to carry on somehow this kind of approach. Uh, the, f the actual uh, nuts and bolts problems are many. They go from, for instance, what kind of, what kind of, of soil conditions you have, uh, how you're going to take care of the problems of, of uh, refusals and waste. how to schedule your program so that you can, you can make use of the buildings as soon as they are built. How you can uh, somehow, thank you, have uh, different centers, centers of production and building so that you, you don't get all piled up in one corner trying to do too many things in that corner. Um, the size of the workshops, how many people you can shelter at the beginning uh, without leaving them uh, totally in the open and so on. For instance, in the foundations, we find out that though we are building on, uh, on this uh, basaltic uh, columnade, you know, ba basaltic formations have become like columns, piers uh, of basalt. And though this is the main structure of, of this site, we have pockets of soil and rubbles and so on. So while we are doing the foundation for the small buildings, in a way it, it more, it's more expensive that kind of soil, that condition, that uh, the condition we have in, in Scotland, which is just fine soil and so on. But when we get into the larger structure, then we know that building on rock is going to be a, a big advantage because we are not going to go down uh, 150 feet so to find a, a bedrock or um, we, we will not to float big structure with massive foundations and so on. How do you handle circulation? In that building? 
that's going to be, I think, a very pretty good. Because, first of all, the size is such that you're always very close to where, wherever you want to go. And then there are uh, alternate routes to go wherever you want to go. <clears throat> In the sense that we have uh, the vertical transpiration system, which is for every two columns, you have a, a battery of elevators and, uh, and staircases. And then uh, you have uh, bridging structures. You have those apses, which give you uh, another kind of circulation, optional circulations. You have connections between the apses, the bridging structure going on the other side of the building. We have uh, um, ramps and uh, some suspension bridges only for pedestrians, naturally. So that e wherever you are, you have a certain kind of choice if you want to get there in a hurry or if you like to just get there leisurely and uh, maybe uh, by being uh, uh, somehow in submitted to different kinds of uh, connection with the outside, views, uh, telescopic uh, see, scene of, of the outdoor through the inside and so on. But it's mainly the, the fact that it's so small that you can really get around very easily. The roof is a, a connecting link. You, once you get on the roof, you can go just about anywhere to any kind of battery or elevators to come down. <coughs> Yes. What kind of people are you looking to live there? A rather homogeneous group from a particular sect of people? Yeah. The human environment and in, in contrast or in relationship with the non-human environment and so on. If you didn't develop that way, then I would like to see it more, more of a cross-section of the, you know, of a... Well, how, how well does it uh, develop your philosophy, your theories, that a group living in such tight context, if they are primarily a homogeneous type of people, since the city is heterogeneous? Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not under the illusion of building a city of 3,000 people. It's, it's never going to be a city. But I think that there will be a relationship between activities within this building that will illustrate quite well some of the questions that have come up. For instance, the relationship between the, the private and, and the non-private. It, it won't matter so much the fact that the different privates, uh, uh, nucleus are, are homogeneous or tend to be heterogeneous. The fact, the main thing it would be to see how they, how compatible they are in their own private uh, environment with the public environment which is at the, the doorstep of their own private environment. But it's going to be a limited exper experiment mainly because of the size of the community in any, in any case. And uh, I think in, in a campus you can have quite a bit of variety as far as uh, the backgrounds of the people and uh, the, the interests of the people and so on. It's, it's a microcosmos somehow. And keep in mind that again uh, I compare this to, uh, to the first uh, aircraft or the first automobile or the first motorcycle, the first washing machine. So it, it would be, in many ways, would be a very funny contraption. And the next step would be, would be to make those, this contraption more effective. Yes. We are uh, plugged in into a public service uh, system. W on the roof, we have a design for a, for a sun collector, but it would be mainly to produce some hot, hot water, probably, more than anything else. Uh, then how do you predict the next uh, <coughs> ecologies, uh, what the sources of energy in the may be? Well, I, <coughs> I think that the problem of energy is, 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 uh, has two phases. One is uh, the amount and the other one is the quality. In other words, how much we need and how pollutant the source of energy is. And if, if we can cut down the, the, si the need, the size of the need, then uh, even if the source of energy is pollutant, which is probably going to be for a long time, you're cutting down into the problem of pollution by cutting down into the problem of waste. 
So it's not so much to come up with a new source of energy, which is very important, but in a way it's beyond me because I'm not an engineer or scientist or technologist. It's to be able to set up environments which are going to ask much less energy in order to, to, to be able to function. And that's why I think that the contribution of, of this idea toward the, the problem of energy, it's not marginal, but it's, it's very fundamental. It's the fact that you are trying to come up with a system which is frugal by, by definition, by the simple fact of being self-contained, miniaturized, and complex. The wastefulness of what we have now, it's so explicit now, it's so evident that we cannot really uh, be serious when we talk about, you know, cutting down the size of the, of the, of the kilowatt uh, input for each family. It, you can save a little, but you're not going to, to do very much. I mean, you can, you can go back to the, to the hand toothbrush and, uh, you know, all those things, but that's not the main thing is that we are, we are setting up isolated cells on the landscape that need lots of energy to support themselves in winter to, to keep warm, in summer to keep cold. And then the fact that you had to, you had to serve those systems. You serve them in the sense of connecting those with, with other cells and with larger cells, which are the, the marketplaces, the learning places, the social places, and so on. And the, the automobile, again, becomes a very good example. I mean, you, the thought of, of needing uh, that amount of energy to go and buy a a, ca a can of beer or a, a cake of soap or something like that and multiply that by, by the billions of times we are doing it every day and then really be serious about the, this problem of energy. It doesn't make sense at all. I mean, we are fooling ourselves now in, in believing that we are going to solve the energy problem by, by keeping the system that we have going, the, the physical system that we have going. Yes? Along the same line, then, have you established or attempted to establish any kind of mathematical models so that you can quantitatively compare, say, your proposals to the existing system or to alternative proposals? That's right. That's really the, the one thing that I would like to do if I get any money from somewhere because I think that's absolutely essential. And uh, I think that some of the results would be startling probably. And we might uh, uh, an outfit in New York that has been working with us has obtained a grant. There'll be five students from Stony Brook, I think, I don't know. And, and an architect, there'll, there'll be somehow uh, have a grant. And I, one of the things I would like to do would be this, to take a community, I don't know, uh, what size, and then try to make a comparative study between this community, the, which would be an orthodox, you know, community, let's say, with what we could suggest instead of it and come up with figures. Because that, that, that probably would, would start to open uh, the way to a possible intervention of government or so on, because they need hard facts. And I don't know how hard those facts could be because we are still dealing with simulation and, you know, with projections and so on, but maybe there would be something there that would shake them up. I would like to have a university undertake that. Seems to me a very good uh, problem to, to tackle. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I have papers, and I I used to give them away, but I, I cannot now because Double Day is going to put them into a book. But some of those papers try to go at that problem from different angles. Well, one example that <coughs> I work around now and then is uh, compare two different stages of, of organic life and then see somehow very quickly but uh, very clearly where, where the more, the greatest richness of experience is. And I, I think I used the, the coral reef as one example, and then uh, any kind of mammal, for instance, and compare the two. And if you take a coral reef, you see that, it, in a way, it's a, it's a city, an elementary city, 
made of little animals, the polyps, whatever you call them, housed in their own little home, connected uh, structurally into this sometimes very gigantic uh, system. And this system works very well. It works very well because the, the, the social life of this system is almost nil. It's very elementary. The, the mental life probably is an existence in, in compared to what it might be in, to a, in a mammal uh, society. And the cultural life definitely is not there. And then there is another aspect of the coral reef, which is that the delivery and retrieval system is the most perfect. The water does everything. Comes in, feeds, cleans, keeps the right condition, right temperature, and so on. So you're, you're dealing with, a, let's say, with a city of very elementary form, very efficiently served, making for a happy uh, life, but very dim and very element, you know, very limited. And then you might take a, another step, maybe in between the mammal and the, what is the the mollusk or something. Uh, you can take a, the, a beehive or an anteel. And there you see again that there is a great efficiency there. There is a fantastic discipline, a rigorous discipline, great organization, and miniaturization. But you're still dealing with something that, uh, that uh, is this, uh, on this side of consciousness, in a way on this side of learning, and very definitely on this side of, of culture and civilization. So it's a very striking example of how life can organize itself in communities at the level that concerns those communities. Uh, great social interaction, no cultural interaction at all, unconsciousness, free will absent, moral and ethics absent. It's a, it's a word of innocence. And then you go, you go into the let's say into the human kingdom, the mammals. And you see that new aspects are coming in. You have, you have this uh, uh, self-definition, uh, self-assertion, conscious reflection, the ability to plan, the ability to change, uh, the aban abandonment, the living out of the coercion of the deterministic situation so that you move from, uh, from uh, the statistical universe into the willful universe. You, uh, you have self-determination. And you have more and more the ability of, to plan, not your own present only, but your own future. Well, you always plan the future anyhow. So the genetic aspects of the structure of the society are somehow uh, not put aside, but uh, toned down and uh, cultural aspects are coming in very powerfully. Well, if you compare those, those uh, three stages, you see that you're always moving from a certain degree of complexity to a degree of complexity which is much higher. The, the bee is more complex than the, than the coral uh, animal, and we are more complex than, than the bee. And you can extend that to all sorts of manifestation of life and every level uh, from the vegetal into the animal uh, and into the mental. And always, uh, you see always this fact that wherever life is more intense and more conscious and self-conscious and more uh, uh, culturally and spiritually oriented, the more this complexity is present and growing. And then uh, if you try to see what complexity is, you see that it's, it's the ability of a certain event or a certain performance, a certain organism to, to be very resilient to the challenges of the environment, which means every time a challenge come, comes in or is within the, the animal, the animal is able to come up with a the, with the response, which has to be swift, measured, uh, has to be congruous to the challenge. And this is only obtainable through this complex uh, interaction of, uh, of uh, information, uh, the, the, the coding of the information, finding the, the right storage where you can retrieve the, the, the stored information so that you can begin 
to make the information into understanding and then you move from understanding into, into response. Well, this is obtainable only if you have this fantastic interaction, this fantastic interweaving of things within a very small space. And the smallness of the space is mainly because the information cannot wait too long. When, when it waits too long, it becomes uh, irrelevant so that uh, the animal cannot respond if the animal dies. So there is a, a, a direct, uh, almost a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between the, the complexity of the animal and the size of it. In other words, the amount of, of, of events happening within it, which is the miniaturization aspect. So on one side, on one side you have the information, on the other side you have the structure that is able to, to make the information uh, viable and, and, uh, and responsive and fit to the challenge. And this, can, this happens through the miniaturizing process. The smallest the, smallest the distances, the, the more this ability to respond to a, to a certain challenge is going to be present. So that the big struggle of nature has been to, to be able to become more complex through this miniaturizing process. And the brain of our brain is the best example. It's a universe. It's really a universe of information and, and data uh, contained in very few pounds of matter using a very small amount of energy. And it's able to, to sustain <clears throat> ourselves and not just that but to have a surplus which is the free, the free determination and have this surplus because it's so fantastically compact, so, so fantastically complex and small. So it's a good example of, of complexity miniaturization. Well, if you, if you take, again, if you take the, the brain, if you take a, a man and then you take a, a mouse, you say, well, the man is much bigger than the mouse. The fact is the, the, the complexity of the man is probably, in a sense, infinitely greater than the complexity of the mouse because the mouse has uh, evidently a, a very subtle uh, physiological organization. It has a the ability to, uh, to um, react to the environmental challenges in very good ways, but at the same time is so limited that it, you cannot speak of a cultural, for instance, uh, uh, aspect of the life of the mouse. You can only speak of a social aspect. You cannot really talk about creativity in the mouse. We don't have uh, Beethoven's mouse, um, Ernst Einstein mouse, and so on. The, the mouse uh, level of reality is bound, bound to uh, very much to a genetic coding that the mouse has been developing, uh, by the way, through the function follows, follows form uh, dictum. But it's limited compared to what we are to a certain level with, that we transcend very so substantially. So I think the complexity of the, of the human it's infinitely greater than the complexity of the mouse, so that you have more events going on into a human than you have in going into a mouse. So it's not true to say that the mouse is more, is more miniaturized than the man. It's the opposite. It, again, it's like, like comparing a, in a much lower kind of degree of complexity, a, um, a molecule, a um, organic molecule to, uh, let's say, a grain of sand, though the grain of sand is, it might be much smaller than a, than a giant molecule. I mean, a, a molecule of composing a grain of sand is much smaller. The, the complexity of the, of the organic molecule is so great, so much greater that that's where the miniaturization is in a greater uh, uh, amount because miniaturization defines the amount of events that you have, you have with the, uh, within the same uh, space with the same amount of matter involved. So it's not a question of, of size so much as a question of relationship between the complexity and the, the amount of matter and energy needed. Yes? Uh, say it again. The beach is an aggregate, and that's why the beach is not so alive. It's very dim, dull. It might have a, a a, a psychic charge which is so infinitesimal that we just say the beach is inorganic, which means it doesn't have anything to do with life. So there, there again, it's not a question of 
size is a question of the amounts of events that are going on in the beach, not in the beach in the sense that you have animals using it, but the beach in the sense of the, of the uh, billions of, or so of grains of, of sand. So the, there is more life in, in the little bug digging into the sand than there is in the whole beach. Uh, as a as a as a uh, uh, physical uh, entity, and that's where uh, that's where miniaturization is in the early animal. The complexity is there, so there is more there is more infinity in a way in the little bug, infinity of complexity than there is in the, in the, in, the, in the, the whole beach. Yes. Why is there some Don't, uh, you, you have to have, you cannot just have to have a sum, you have to have an integration. And what doesn't work in the beach is that there is no integration. Each granule of sand can be totally isolated. It's not conscious of the, the next grain of sand. It can be isolated, can be with another quadrillion of grains of sand. It doesn't make any difference for the grain of sand. It's total uh, segregation, which is very much what we have to be very careful about because uh, at our level of consciousness, we tend to do the same thing. I segregate myself from you, you segregate yourself from everybody else. So you tend to repeat the, the grain of sand condition. And maybe the coral reef, it's a better example because, because the coral reef, coral reef has already, uh, you're dealing already with life and some kind of consciousness, even if it's very dim, but you're dealing with life. And you see that if we, if we uh, get too close to this condition of segregation, each little animal being really independent for the next animal, then we cut down into the size of the complexity of life. By cutting down the size of the complexity, we, en we end up by having a dim life, the life of, a, of the little animal cased into the coral uh, substructure. Uh, and what, what life is, it's the ability to integrate itself into something more than the sum of the parts which is what uh, the physical does. A beach is made of, uh, of the sum of all the grains of sand that you find in the beach. But the degree of complexity is somehow identical in the, in the grain of sand uh, as it is in the beach. So the amount is not, is not the, it has to do with complexity. It's the amount of interaction that makes complexity. Yes? Um, what kind of limits do you foresee, say, size and population Uh, cities in terms of order, before social communication, uh, uh, learning process starts to break down. I don't think any, anyone has, <clears throat> has any idea what size it should be in, on the abstract. When you come down to a contextual condition, then you can start to, to think in terms of size. It still would be a very difficult thing to decide, uh, you know, uh, a priori. We have to come up with enough information to get an idea of what the conditions are there. And that, that relates to the local conditions, to the natural to the climate, to the background of the population that might, involve, might be involved, to the main activity of this population, and the relationship between the local conditions with the continental and uh, uh, earthly conditions. That's why a survey of the, you know, of the whole earth as far as um, means and needs is so important. What kind of, um, the limit on uh, walking distance you find? Well, I would suggest that the average walking distance of few, let's say 1,000, 1,500 feet, it's, it's a very acceptable. In fact, it's almost auspicable because it's good for your system. That means that if, if you have a structure which has, a, let's say, a, um, a diameter, supposing that it tends to be, uh, have a vertical axis of one mile, then uh, the average distance that you would have to walk horizontally probably would be within that kind of, of distance. And I think that's, that's good. Is this a controlling factor in the ultimate size of well, yeah, I, I think it, it's very important to be able to uh, eliminate gadgetries when uh, gadgetries are tend to become a, a, 
an unnecessary load on the, on the price tag of whatever you do. And uh, it might be important enough to say that maybe this, this community should not become much larger than a certain di dimension, the average dimension, because that might involve a transportation system which is, is not warranted by just that kind of reasoning. So to contain the size of a, of a community so that you can use your legs as a real, uh, the main, main uh, uh, way of moving about, I think it's very important. Uh, a city like New York, where you've got millions of people, uh, if you say break this down into modules that you can fit into a certain size and social interaction, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, matrix and whatnot, then you start connecting these modules with the transportation system, uh, where you're still handling millions of people. Start to become cumbersome, or would you advocate spreading this out over a larger area? Well, that, that's where somehow the, the self sufficiency of the city becomes very important, which doesn't mean that the city becomes uh, isolated because it can survive without contact. It means that there is enough going on in the city so that this commuting becomes more of a voluntary, of a, let's say, leisure kind than being a coercive kind. If, if I do something for the reason of survival, I'm going to do it. Uh, and I'm going to accept all sorts of coercion again, the coercion of traveling maybe two hours a day to, to make a living. Well, this is a very substantial coercion, but we, we say, well, that's life. Well, it's baloney, that's not life, that's, uh, that's a coercion. So if we can uh, take away the coercion from any of the things we do uh, as far as con connecting and communicating and so on, then uh, this kind, this communicating and connecting is not going to be have uh, those loads that we have now, the peak at noon or a peak at eight and then five o'clock and so on. So that means cutting down the size and the cost and the maintenance and the bureaucracy f for, for the system that we are dealing with. So I, for a New York, I don't know where, where the answer would be. You know, you have to know more what the problems are, but uh, it's quite possible that Manhattan could become uh, maybe two cities to cities that do not have to have this massive uh, commuting kind of, of motion uh, in a daily cycle. Cities that would be connected in many ways through, through remote communication system, through telephone, uh, television, and so on. And cities where people, most of the people would be able to, to find work within the city, not, not to have to move from this city to that city every morning and so on which is what we do now. We live here and we have to go there and uh, who lives there has to come here. And by doing this, we, we set up a st the stage for the, for the wasted life, really. Yes? How do you visualize the intermediate stage of change between the present day cities and uh, the ecologists? <laughs> well, we are always somehow in, in intermediate stages. This stage, for instance, as I see it, is the withdrawal of this society from itself. We had cities which were not very good ever in this country, but they were somehow working. And then uh, we decided that we would not accept what, what was there because it was getting worse, it was getting uh, squalid, it was getting sterile and so on. So we decided that we would piggyback everything we have in the city and move out. So we have the exodus of the American society in, toward the, the edge of the city. Well, this is a massive withdrawal. It's really a whole society getting away from itself. So at this point, we have this, this motion from the core, from the central city into the suburb, suburban conditions. And then interwoven with this, we have the, the, migrate, the migratory flow that has always been in, in this country. Uh, maybe, I don't know, one third or so of the population moving from city to city, from community to community because of reasons of jobs or uh, choice or schools or who knows what. And then we have the battle of the, of the center of the city trying to survive and try to, to make it one way or the other one. So we are in a transitional stage right now and a very powerful one. Probably the, the most revolutionary force in this country now is the, the urbanite becoming a suburbanite. It's a massive revolution, which is really a phase of withdrawal. And in a way, this, this person and with its family li leaving the center, going out, it is uh, the, the main revolutionary force that is going to make those centers empty 
a vacuum and it is going to cause the reversal of the process into an implosion whereby maybe the, we, we get this, uh, you know, gathering of the energy of man and man itself into the, their college idea. But how this is going to phase itself, it's, I, I would be the last one to make a guess. But if you could set up a few, few examples that are doing their jobs, then probably people would, would consider them, would investigate them, would want to experience them, and that the market would be created. Well, yeah, as, as a guinea pig, in a way, yes. All right. Um, therefore, it's going to have a certain expansion. Usually, cities appear because they conceal certain expansion. Mm -hmm. Not always, but they do. Um, my, my doubt is you can put three or four examples, three or four ecologies that could give an example of how an ecology would work. Yeah. But they should be located in such a way that they would fulfill certain expansion, in which case some other city has to be there before. Not, not necessarily. We are, we are building new cities uh, constantly. Uh, General Motors decided he's going to have a plan there, so he's going to put, set the plan there because he knows that there, are, there is a market there, a labor market or uh, resources or who knows what, tax uh, uh, facilitations and so on. So it's not true that we are only rebuilding what we have. We are, build, we are trying to rebuild what we have and also we are setting up new communities. And. Uh, as a pilot plant, it, it maybe it's not that relevant to have it in, uh, in the best place where you really need a new city. You're, you're trying to demonstrate something else. You're trying to demonstrate that even though many, many of the, the elements are, might not be the most favorable, you might be able to set up such an intense phenomenon there that is going to work out. And if you succeed in that, then, uh, then uh, the better for, uh, for conditions which are more in need of an of a, of a urban center. So I don't, I don't have any qualms about the fact that we are in the wilderness. Well, all this country used to be wilderness, all of it. You know. So it's a question of perspective in a way, you know, the time, the time uh, lag, the time gaps that you're dealing with, but mainly in the, in the sense that we are, we are in a very uh, poor condition now to to make decisions about the future and, and to go about it uh, boldly and with some kind of uh, hopefulness. So we have to try to set up here and there some, some schemes that are, might, might be working better. And Arizona has, has, if Arizona had water, which is a big, big if, more water, let's say, and that water m might come if we get into the, you know, the south desalinization or who knows what, moving water from the, from the northern uh, part of the, the west of this continent and so on. Arizona, it's a, it's a pretty inspiring kind of landscape of land, climate and light and... Uh, uh, I want to move for a second to another point that was one of the, the questions in my mind. How would uh, your ecologist work in a non-technological society, say third world? Well, I have a grudge about the car, and if we could get China, for instance, as I was saying last night, to be able to make the jump from the pre-car uh, age to the post-car age without going through the car problem, I think that would be, a, by itself, would be a great, great uh, leap. And I don't mean the car, the elimination of the car from the earth. I mean uh, the, the confining of the car to the function the car should, should perform and can perform very well, which is a function of leisure, a function of specialized thing, but not a function of moving the, the bulk of society, of, of mankind, for reasons of, of necessity. Because evidently, if there's a contradiction there between the wakefulness of, of the shift of the way, of the, the mode of the car and the fact that you, you are doing this for survival, why should I no. have no. such an expensive and extravagant mm -hmm. way of moving the car? Uh, I was thinking more, but I'm a developed society, which is not, uh, which is, being colonialized before. Yeah. And I, that's why yeah. I mentioned like third world, Africa and Latin America, in which case the automobile is there already. That's yeah. a very expensive way to that. Uh, and there is such lack of funds that we cannot finance and use for fiat and can have a regular automobile. 
Yeah, well, uh, if, if, if this kind of nation could really uh, pull together their, uh, its own uh, problems, try to, <coughs> to see into them, then possibly the, the answer would be to concentrate in one, somehow in one spot to get a solution which is really a solution, is not a, a patchwork or a, or a um, what do you call it, not a compromise, a expediency, only expediency, but come up with something that might begin things rolling, start things rolling, because I really think that the, the validity of this idea is that it's more economical. That's the basis of it. It's a better plumbing system for society. From there on, everything is open. So I don't see why a, 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 um, a nation that is somehow involved already in technological revolutions, in technological uh, sophistication, but has uh, limited means, should not try to look into it. And in many, many of the society ha have somehow a political structure that can ask you know, for, a, for a, something like that more easily than in this country where, where the consensus has to be always you know, total when you're dealing with public money, for instance. But there are examples, uh, for instance, the, the Indian Americans, they had, they had this, um, at least some of, some of the ethnic Indian Americans had this idea of very, very tightly uh, organized communities. But the, the level of demands and the level of their needs was so different from one, what the one we have now that we had to somehow extrapolate from those examples in the examples which are within the context of our needs. Yes? Do you see then a, a need for man's uh, full outlook towards, say, his outside work activity being changed? That, mm -hmm. say, his, his cultural orientation to adapt to this type of living? Well, <clears throat> no, matter, no matter how we go about the future, we know that if it's true that automation and uh, with the wealth of cybernetics and so on and on is going to come upon us, we are going to face this problem of what to do with our time. And we are not facing it very well now. Well, we, we advertise the fact that if you don't have to work, you can golf all, all your life and go fishing and so on, which is, which is it's important in many ways, but it's, it's irrelevant in many other ways. Life is more than golfing and fishing. So what, what we are going to do with, with our leisure time, if the leisure age comes, and it's in a way it's already here, at least maybe we have it only for a few years and then we find out that it's a catastrophe, but we are entering the age, age of leisure now. And if we, can, uh, if we can make it without getting more opulent and uh, go through a very di disastrous kind of, uh, what do you call it, nemesis, then, uh, we, we might be there soon, and what we are going to do with ourselves, that's a big question. Probably the learning, the fact that we are going to be learning creatures throughout your, our lives, it's one of the answers, but then what, what you make with the learning? To, to accumulate information is very, very important because we are going to do something with it. And the learning is what you do, it's the first step of what you do with information, but then you want to, you want to apply maybe this learning so that uh, the learning becomes a, a public dominion and is going to do something for everybody. And this cannot be only uh, on a purely mental level, it has to be also an environmental level. So we might be faced with maybe going back and do some uh, physical work because we have so much leisure time and we want to be again uh, the makers of our environment. Well, I don't know if that was an answer. But.
Well, I, I wasn't going to say it because, first of all, I don't know. Second, even if I knew, I, I, even if I thought I knew, probably I sh uh, that's, that's not my business in a way. Uh, in, a, in a very rough way, very, very naive way, it's like saying that I'm, I'm trying to construct a piano, not, uh, not to tell you what to play on the piano. And you can, you can retort and say that we are, but when you, when you build a piano, you already put in conditions for me to perform, which is right. But those conditions can be, you know, they are not that, that uh, coercive. You can still be a great musician or a lousy musician, a, a good player or a poor player. The, the point is that you need an instrument. I'm, I'm trying to set up the conditions by which this instrument it might be available to you. So I'm concerned in, in the instrument, not in the music. I hope that I can do more than that. I hope that I can put a little music in the instrument also. But that's another question. Well, no, it no, it yeah, it should come out uh, just as an instrument. It can be a piano, a harp, a flute, a, 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 you know, the, the apparatus that we have, uh, the co the voice uh, apparatus, whatever you call it, and so on. So it's just a device to make sounds. What the sounds are going to be, it's up to, in this case, would be up to the society that is using the instrument. And this again, because I really feel that there's always a necessity, a step, an intermediate step between the desire, a certain intention, and the, the performance. And in this case, is the desire to produce sound and not having the, the instrument to produce the sound. So I say, maybe I have a piano for you, or a flute, or something. The fact that I'm part of the, of the contest means that I like to play the piano myself also, or I like to come up with some sounds which are a little better than just the scattered uh, accident. But that when you, for example, choose a 10 by 17 module or something, you, that's considerably different from what's existing now. So you must have something in mind as far as all right, what kind of person is going to be living in and be yeah. content living in a 10 by 17 module. That's right. Yeah, uh, one, one thing uh, I to add there is that that's not the only module. That's what, we, what I would tend to call the minimal module. And uh, you can say, well, uh, what makes you think that you know what the minimal module is? And it's not that I, I can tell you that I know. It's just that I feel somehow that that's a module where you can develop a pretty good uh, you know, environment for yourself or maybe for a very small family or uh, two persons and so on. And uh, the other thing is that it comes the moment when you have to move from uh, ideas into reality, in, into pragmatic conditions. And this is especially so for, for anybody involved with the environment. We can talk our heads off about the most wonderful theories. If we cannot uh, somehow translate or move from that level of consciousness to the business of building a room or building a space where you can organize something of your life, we are not going to get anywhere. And this is one of the problems, I think, with the schools of today. We, there is a very great resentment in defining anything, because it seems to be once you define something, you, you, you break. Uh, your freedom is going to be impaired, and you are you're stuck. And unfortunately, uh, life is getting stuck somehow with something that is going to be helpful for you. But you have to get, you have to accept some kind of framework sooner or later. And in this case, this framework of 17 by 17 came up from a number of considerations. One was I was trying to touch at the beginning, which was that I like to feel, I like to be able to offer to a certain group of people this ability of working under a shelter, which is very much connected with the environment, but it has a, its own qualities. The necessity of giving a, a certain dimension to this shelter in order to <coughs> define spaces which are not too contrived and too, um, um, what do you call it, too small. At the same time, try to limit this uh, this blowing up because of questions of cost, for instance. In our, in our case, we are experimenting, so we can go 
so far in, in uh, coming up with large structures and so on. So the, there are many reasons why the 17 by 17 came up. But being one of the five different modules is not that it's imposing on you, your environment. But in a way, you elect, if you come there, it's because you elect to, to, to have this experience. So that's another kind of option that it has to be considered. Nobody would be coerced into it. But if you decide that you want to experience something like that, then you have to accept limitations. Uh, does it give any answer? Maybe we can get back to it. There is a very uh, great change an individual is subjected to is uh, directly related to the amount of illness that they experience. And I was wondering uh, if you could say something about this in relation to like the three different types of